All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday right here on YouTube. You got to make sure you subscribe. Helps the channel and lets you know when these interviews are coming out. Also, maybe you think you can ask better questions of the guests than I can. Maybe you want to see these interviews a few weeks before everyone else. Go down to the Patreon link in the description. Pick the appropriate tier and you can be doing that. Talking about guests. Got a cool one today from back in my old home of New York City. He's got a book out. Frank Bello from Anthrax is here. The book is called Fathers, Brothers, and Sons Surviving Anguish, uh, Abandonment, and Anthrax. That's a lot to survive. It's available October 12th, but it is available for pre-order right now. So it comes out October 12th. You go in the description, get the book. By the time you watch this, it might already be available. You definitely got to get it. We're going to get all into that what Anthrax is up to, and much more right after this. All right, here he is, Frank Bello. What's up, Jason? How are you, man? All right, Frank. I'm glad you're here. I got to tell you, I've been reading more books than I've uh, read in my whole life, I think, because <laughs> of this show. And whenever someone has a book, I go, please don't let the title uh, be a tongue twister. And uh, you got a lot of words in yours, but it makes, <laughs> it, it, makes, it makes a strong point. And as I said to you, so I'm about halfway through and wow. literally waiting for you to come on. I'm reading the book and I want to let people know that, and I wouldn't lie. I don't, I don't sell a product that I don't like. If I do, I just say it's available. But yeah. if I like it, I tell the truth, and I am hooked on every word of this book. Oh, and thank you, man. I know what you're you you say right out that your goal was to make it feel like I'm sitting there talking to you if we're yeah. having a beer or we're out getting coffee, and it, it does feel that way. It does not right. feel like someone else wrote this book. I read books sometimes. I go, "There's no way this guy talks like that." <laughs> With yours, you get that feeling, and I personally relate to it as a New Yorker born in the Bronx. Um, you describe and paint the picture of New York City. And so I want people to know that if they're tuning in to hear every trivial anthrax thing that ever happened, this is probably the wrong interview. And <laughs> the reason I decided to mix it up was because you can go on YouTube right now and watch a 24 video series about the history of anthrax. This is the most detailed history of anthrax. Anything you want to know about the records, it's in this YouTube series. And also it's in Frank's book. So what I'd rather talk about is some of these experiences that are coming up in your book, some of the stuff in New York City, and then we'll talk about what Anthrax is up to now as well. So sure, first sure. of all, you got to tell me what makes you decide to write a book. Well, well Joe, Joe McIver, McIver, my co-writer, co -writer. we've been, we've been friends, friends for a for long, long time, time. and um, he's been after me to do this for a long time. And I've been on tour, as you know, I've been on the road for my life. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the time uh, when this COVID thing started, you're looking at exactly where I wrote the book with, with, with him via internet, everything, all the lines came out. Um, and it was time. I was, I was in my basement as I am now. <laughs> I'm in my basement in New York right now. This is where I kind of live at this point. My, I have no life. We all know that. Mm -hmm. But truth being, it was the right time. I was ready for it. I was ready to confront things that I haven't confronted in my life. And through therapy has got me through them. I had to revisit some of the scary stuff and the horrible stuff that I've gone through. Um, it was the time and it made it easy writing with Joel because he's written so many great books and he's so easy to talk to. Um, it was definitely, he could ignite a fire on like, he'll give me a line from a, a, a story that I completely forgot about and he'll just open the passage for me and it'll just keep flowing. And you get a, you, you get pages out of that, and the stories are fun. It's fun for me to relive, to be honest, because you know what happens after all these years, forty some odd years of touring, you forget some of these things, and they're stored away in the back of your brain. And what happens is you need one little thing to click it open, mm -hmm. and then it just flows. Like there's some great Metallica stories that are hanging out. You, know, I don't know if you've read them yet, but there's some fun hanging out, great old school stories that people really appreciate and love. Uh, because they're my point of view, hanging out, getting loaded, just a good time, going to just going to different places with the band. Um, and there's, there's some other stuff that, you know, people don't know. Like, for, for instance, with, um, dealing with my brother's death, right. um, you know, and people 
been talking about this and people who've read the book, they don't know how to approach me on it. And what I try to tell them is um, it's therapeutic for me. It's cathartic to do this. Um, for the background of that, as a Bronx boy, you know this. Um, my brother Anthony, at 23 three years old, was murdered in the Bronx where we were. 1996, yeah. 1996 was a horrible time, as it would be for anybody. It was a horrible time for myself, my family, the band. And um, we went to, through the Bronx criminal courts, as you know, are not the best place to be in. And we had to go through that to try to get the person that did this, you know, to get justice for my brother. Long story short, um, we never got justice. Um, the, the, <laughs> and you'll understand this. The witness disappeared. Right. You know, it's uh, it's more like a Scorsese movie than anything else. I take you through it in the book, as, as you'll see. Um, and long story short, I went dark. After that happened, I kind of snapped and I went really dark. And um, I went, I was a person I didn't know. I kind of went black and I, I was a hunter. I went hunting. To be really honest and frank, I went hunting. I talked to people I never talked to before about guns, about uh, locations, how to do it, um, stalking. I was just really watching certain aspects of what it went on in that area that my brother was murdered in. And look, I was a hunter. I'm just going to be as honest as I can be. Thank God, two weeks after, uh, uh, every, every night, 10, 10, 30 at night, I went out of my house and there was a mission. And I just did it, patrolling. I had the lights off. The whole thing was done. Parked in the right spots, just waiting, waiting for that one moment. And two weeks after that, something came to me and I started thinking of my mom because my mom was the first person I saw when I went down to the murder scene, my brother in, in the Bronx. He was on the floor, obviously passed. They had a sheet over him, just like you would see at a crime scene, just, you know, law and order, whatever, one of yeah. those crime scenes. What, what, what I put into the book, because I wanted people to understand what I was dealing with and what my family was, my mom specifically was dealing with. They had the sheet over my brother, God rest his soul. But what they missed was the, his sneakers, his sneakers that I knew he just bought. And um, the, the sheet was off the sneakers. And I saw the sneakers and I had imprinted in my brain because there was blood on those sneakers. And it really snapped me it really it really made me go to a different place that I, i've never been and that from that moment it really scared me all i can remember is hugging my mom and um and not a word was said to it, each other we just didn't understand it so after that i went to this dark place two weeks later i started to think about my mom and i said look if i do this she's going to lose again she's either going to lose my son death or jail Either way, she's going to lose me because I was going to do it, dude. I'm, I'm no tough guy. I don't pretend to be a tough guy. <clears throat> but this wasn't me. This wasn't me. It was that other guy that I, I don't want to know that guy. It was fucking scary. And to be honest, through a lot of therapy and all the, my family, you know, I, I understood why I went there and all that stuff. Now I understand it. But um, I don't want anybody to ever go there. But kind of take you through it with the book and you'll understand. So when it says anguish in the, in the title and all this, the long terms in the title... It takes you through the story. And, yeah, and um, I did read that chapter. Um, and yes, you paint this sort of death wish scenario for people who've seen that movie. You know, uh, you're you're fed up and you try to do something. And I know you don't talk completely about mm -hmm. it because it's sort of connected. And I think that you are aware of the person who, who did it. And obviously the person was on trial. And yeah, a witness was probably intimidated. Um, yeah leave and this is a really difficult thing to know that this person uh is existing yeah it is just like i mean i've seen it before but i've only personally i've seen it before in movies i've seen this but when it happens to you it's very real and uh, you live with it i wake up with it every day you know it happened how many years ago 1996 i wake up with that every day not knowing how to deal with it and saying all right he's in a better place right and this is putting his name in a book and understanding what kind of great person my brother was. It was, it, it makes me feel a little bit better and telling the people why, why I have the anger issues that I've had to deal with all my life. And it, you kind of get the picture of who I am on the other side. So, uh, and where this intensity comes from in me, I guess, uh, it, it's, it's really, it's an open book is what it is. Yeah. I want to point out that, um, Portions of the book are donated to charity, and I want you to mention those charities because I know that's something that's important. Yeah, it's um, 
I want to get it right because I have yeah, it. Yeah, that's written. the main yeah. thing to actually. Yeah, I want people the links to them. Um, yeah, the links to them. Um, and I want to give these to you later. Um, here we go. Make sure it's uh, www.forthechildren.org. Mm -hmm. Again, www.forthechildren.org. And also, another very important one, National Fatherhood Initiative. So that's www.fatherhood.org. So, right. look, at the end of the day, I've been very lucky for what I've done in my career. I, I get it. Uh, what, what I found writing this book, not only was it cathartic for my life, but people that have read it now and people that are getting the gist of it are saying it's helping them in their way. Whatever kind of loss you've, 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 put, you've been through in your life. For me, it's about, look, if I can do this and brush myself off of whatever kind of trauma you've been through in your life, there's a lot of people hurting right now. And look, I'm not just trying to sell a book here. For me, it's I've been very lucky in my career. Uh, why not try to help people now at this point? Why not give back a little bit and say, look, I got lucky with, with this band thing. You know, that was my outlet was the music. And I had this. This is kind of this is my path and how I did it. If you want to follow it, fine. That's great. But you, I just want to show people that you can brush yourself off if they get knocked down, really knocked down. And, um, and you can move on. And you can move on with the life and, and have a family and, and, and be a good dad and all that good stuff from, from the abandonment. There's so many people, Jason, there's so many people hitting me up because they know what this book is about. And just reading the synopsis, they're just saying about abandonment. People, there's so many people hitting me up about that and just saying, how did you deal with it? And I said, man, it's, it's in the book. And I give my little synopsis on it. And there's a way to do it. You make your own way, man. You make your way. You brush yourself off. And I think it's so important. I tell you, one of the stories dealing with abandonment that I that kind of struck home to me is you tell a story about going to see Don Rickles. You would think that's just an innocent thing, but you sort of get signaled out and brought on stage, and he does this bit where he kind of interrogates you. But when he, he asks you, what does your father do for a living? And what a tough question for somebody who doesn't know their father. And Dude, you hit you're that on, on stage. Head. With this famous comedian, this is supposed to be a laughing moment. And what an awkward thing to answer. And so you tell Don Rickles, you don't know what your father does. Yeah. And uh, just to bring people back, I went, brought my wife out on our anniversary. He went to see Don Rickles. One of my favorite, rest of his soul, he's passed now. But one of my favorite comedians. I got great seats for whatever reason. I got great seats second row. I was nervous about this second row because I know he was abusing people in the front row. So I was like, Teresa, I'm ducking. I told my wife, I'm ducking down. I, I do not want him to make eye contact with me, I'm afraid. You don't want to so, be a hockey puck. And dude, I do not want to be that guy, right? I just want to enjoy this because I want I need a laugh. I, I just want to have a good time. Long story short, he starts the thing and he's it's in the round, right? In, it's a place in Long Island. So it's in the round. It's actually on YouTube, this thing. Westbury uh, Music Fair, right? Westbury Music Fair. Very, very well said. Yeah. So I'm worried. Of course, the people in front of me don't show up. So it's all of a sudden, second row becomes first row, right? So it, it's a straight on to Don, right? It's straight on. And I, so I'm like this. My wife's like sitting up normal, and I'm, I'm a lunatic, like making sure he, nobody can see anything. I'm, he doesn't see me. I don't get picked up. He, come, he does this, this one thing um, where he does some Japanese soldiers when he was in the war, and he was, the, he was the, 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 the upper soldier or whatever, the guy with stripes and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was the guy in charge, and he picks – see him pick out a guy on the other side of the stage, which was awesome. Cool. I'm still ducking down. And <clears throat> he said something that made me cackle. You ever cackle like it's fucking loud? It comes out of your body. You don't know. He said something. I went, <laughs> and I, dude, it's like a shark when he smells blood. He went like this, right? He looked right over eye contact. As much as I was trying not to have eye contact, dude, it was like, it was a beeline laser eye to eye. I'm like, oh, and I knew it. I said, no. He goes, you. Get up here, dude. I was shitting in my pants when I see it because I'm not afraid of any stage. This stage I was afraid of. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I told you nobody. So the people in front of us weren't there. So you got to get up there. So I said, now he goes, yeah, now come, what, what, what are you stupid? You just abusing the shit out of me coming up. So I get up. I'm all nervous about getting on this stage. So I'm, I'm, I climb over the first seat. I trip. I trip onto the stage. That was wrong with you. He's just going off on me. He's just, just what the hell? And he's just looking at me. I was embarrassed. People are laughing because I fell, blah, blah, blah. I get up there and he's just, you know, we're playing these, these soldiers, this other poor soul and myself. And Don's just abusing me. He just kept dropping his mic. Pick it up. Pick it up. And just, he goes, 
Now, when I tell you something, you just say, you're not say yes. So he's doing this whole, this whole gibberish kind of Japanese kind of um, talk. And we have to just say, every, you know, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And he's just dropping it in the mic and just, just complete, people are just hilarious. So then he gets up to that part you're talking about. And he goes, what do you do? I said, I'm a musician. Just so you know, I don't know if you've seen it on a YouTube video. Some guy in the back say, he's in the band Anthrax. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't want him to know music. I'm so, he's going to prolong this, right? Okay. So he didn't hear that. Thank God. Right. So then he asked the father question and I can't believe you pulled this out of all the interviews I did. You're the only one to pull this out because that was a moment where one of the best times of my life, scariest times, but best, I was on on stage with one of my heroes of comedy, one of my all time heroes. It was a, supposed to be a great time. He asked that question. I gutted out my stomach. I went right back to the abandonment thing and it gutted me because I didn't have a fucking answer. I didn't have an answer. What does your father do for a living? I knew way back what he did, but I didn't put it into perspective. And I think I just blanked out because I didn't know. And that was one of those moments. It should have been all blissful, beautiful, beautiful words coming out. I just didn't know. I think I said, I think I said it was oil burner mechanics. I think I came out with something that I remembered. Finally, something came. But that was a great poignant moment that you noticed and I was like wow it all came into play right there because I didn't have an answer to that question and I and I think that that scene in the book opens up the abandonment like um, this is the beginning of it like I you know I, I, I'm a little familiar with your story as I'm reading and I know that it's coming but when you read that part it you you see what what's about to come because here's someone who's raised uh, you know, without a father, and that's just the beginning. It, then going into um, losing your brother. And so as much as there's a lot of fun stuff in the book, and of course we're going to get to that, but mm -hmm. there's also, you know, I, I don't know if a lot of people realize that you were on tour with Metallica when they had the, the, the bus accident. That of course. Cliff Burton lost his life. And I think for you, for, for a reader to read your version of it, somebody who was there firsthand, you saw the guy every day, and you have these yeah. great memories of him, and you paint him, as a, as, a, as a human, you know, a mortal person, which sometimes books don't do. And, uh, and then the decision of what happens, where, where do you go? And as a young person, uh, it, it's great because you, you, as throughout the book, your Uncle Joe's Deli is such a part of the, the New York scene. You, you yeah. paint New York very well. And, and, that, and that's Thank not you. to say that people who aren't from New York won't enjoy it because I think they will. As you always say in the book, it's right out of a Scorsese film. When you talk about, uh, uh, you know, three color cookies, I, I, we call them rainbow cookies. You know, I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm picturing this and I'm picturing these big Italian meals. And I had a, I had Carmine a piece on the show yesterday. I love Carmine. He's amazing. And he He's tells, awesome. he tells a story, you know, Vinny Apice was John Lennon's last drummer. And he tells this story about how his Italian mom would make food for all the music. Je Jeff Beck would come over. So they told John Lennon, you got to try my mom's uh, lasagna. And so she brings him a pan of, did they bring John Lennon a pan of lasagna? A few months later, Carmine's playing the garden with Rod Stewart. And she goes, there, there's John Lennon. And she goes, I got to go ask what he thought of my lasagna. And she goes up to the, him and she says, I made you the lasagna. And he says, oh, thank you. It was great. And she goes, by the way, do you have my pan? And, <laughs> And so, yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> Vinny told me that story. Vinny told me that. And I, I, I was crying. I was, it's so family. That's so deep family about what moms, because the Tupperware and their, their pans are really life. It's really, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I respect it and love it. And I, I really felt that story that it was John Lennon was even more. It was so sweet. I it was so great, man. An Italian mom or grandma doesn't care about John Lennon. She cares nope. about her, her pan, you know. Nope. And so I think that you paint that scene for people to uh, um, to sort of, you know, fall into the, the picture. And for the people who maybe didn't grow up in New York, they've seen those Scorsese movies and, mm -hmm. it, it, and it paints this thing. But so you talk about working at Joe's Deli and all these things. At the same time, you're on tour with Metallica because you were working in that deli for quite some time, you know, and... People think because you're on a record label, you're rich, but that's not the case, obviously. No, we all know that as musicians, we all know that. But um, look, I'm, I'm proud of where I came from. 
I still, I love my Uncle Joe. I miss that deli. I would still, if it was still open, I'd still be hanging out in it. I would still cut a sandwich for myself. I would still make a sandwich for myself. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I still have those skills of making a sandwich uh, where I was, I was getting pretty good at it. I would love to be there again because that is literally why, where I grew up and why I am the person I am. I, that show me life's, um, I mean, there was so many characters making my, my life richer. Where Where those characters? The Bronx, the Bronx, where I grew up, it was right around the corner from where at Throgs Neck, New York, off the Throgs Neck Bridge, mm-hmm. off of Harding Avenue. Down, you get off the, you hit off the Throgs Neck Bridge, you go to Harding Avenue. It was right down. Now, of course, it's condos like everything else. Right. Uh, and I, I think I have a picture of it in the book, uh, that uh, the sign and everything, and it was very endearing. Uh, it, you, you're looking at the place that made me pretty much. It made me um, the characters that came in that store. Really, it was revolving it was revolving because there was so many rich people not rich and financially blue collar people hard workers that had character and um i sucked that in man i I just lived it and i i really enjoyed that time in my life a lot of that's where i get my ball busting Uh, you'll see some of this book uh, most of this book is said although there's some horrible things that go through i go through i try to have a humor with it i try to make people see this this humor uh because that that saves me it kind of takes me out of where i am yeah. Normally when I read an autobiography, I go, let's just get right to it. You know, uh, if I'm reading about Jim Morrison, I don't care. Just tell me about when you're at the whiskey with the doors. You know? and, <laughs> and, and, and that was a bad habit of mine reading people's books, though. And so with your book, I'm glad that you didn't just write an anthrax book. Yeah, yeah man. One, everyone's it's, it's kind of been done. There's other books about anthrax. There's serious. And so if you're an anthrax fan, yeah, you're going to get your side of it and you're going to get some really cool stories that only you could share because you lived it your way. But I do think that your family story and what you you became is really interesting in the way you tell it. And then I not not everyone understands that your uncle is Charlie Benante, who was the drummer yeah. for anthrax, but he's only three years older than you. Yeah. I read the explanation and I still don't completely get it. Explain that to well, me. Well, you know, a big Italian family is how we work. We have a lot of kids and all that stuff. Uh, my grandmother, Tina Babes, who I write in the book, and it's it's dedic- one of the people it's dedicated to. Um, Tina Babes, Benanti, Charlie's mom. That's Charlie's mom. That's the house that I grew up in because when my dad took off uh, and my mom had five kids being left alone on welfare and no money, all that stuff, we went to a, went to, we lost the house and we had to go to a, like a lower income kind of apartment kind of thing. So I went to go move my grandmother because I was getting my ass kicked every day in that going to school. I was getting literally my ass kicked every day. So I went to move in with my grandmother, Tina, we call the Tina base from it's a term of endearment, Tina Benanti, Charlie's mom, my grandmother. My grandmother had my mother, who is Charlie's sister. Am I going too fast? No, no, I'm with you so okay. far. Okay, so my grandmother, Tina Babes, had my mom first. Charlie is a he has a family of five. He has four older sisters. So Charlie's the baby of his of his family. So I grew up with Charlie. I went into that house, which was musical because Charlie was in it. And Charlie was a, an amazing drummer at four years old. And I'm there for proof. Believe me, he was um, and still is. Uh, and I and it kind of we grew up like brothers. We kind of I kind of looked at him and I said, I want to do that. I want to play music. And that was my outlet for all the anguish. Uh, hence the title. All the all the the anguish that I had in my the, uh, in my life the the music was the outlet it made me feel better about things it made me it was a distraction and when I saw Kiss I said I want to do that mm-hmm. that is what I want to do uh, my influencers you know my you know Geezer Butler look Geezer Butler Steve Harris Getty Lee I wanted to be like them because they were doing what I wanted to do in a, in the bass way so they were like more like father figures and and. Gene Simmons, all that, who wrote the, the forward to my book, which I still can't believe I'm very proud of. Who wrote the forward, and Gene is great at most things he does. Yes. His forward is from the heart. I've seen him give people advice. It's from the heart. He's and the what I love is the way you tell your stories about being a young person and basically going out and stalking Kiss. My friends were doing the same thing. I got friends in New York from Staten Island who were waiting outside SAR to meet Kiss. And it's a, it's a, it's great though that you're able to tell these stories. And you know, I, I we'll leave some to the book, obviously. But sure. 
you talk about basically inviting yourselves into studio, whatever you could do, your friends had balls, you would just go in and tell Gene, we wanna hear a new song. And Gene was the type of guy who would play you that song um, and give you some life advice. And many years later, Gene's um, influence on you goes into your own career. You tell a story about Electric Ladyland, Iron Maiden's recording Electric Ladyland. Steve Harris is eating at a restaurant. You see him. He sees you guys outside. He invites you in. You talk about how the way you treated fans was the way your heroes treated you. And it's funny because I worked at Revolver Records on 8th Street, right across the street, and I was in high school, right Love across it. from Electric Ladyland. And when Anthrax was recording in Electric Ladyland, this was a big deal to us. All my <laughs> friends, we got to go down and meet the guys from Anthrax, you know. That's so cool. Which you would see guys walking up the street. And, you know, you, you know, and it was a very, so for us, it was like this, as I'm reading your book, I'm seeing this full circle. You know, I'm a few years younger. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, these guys are seeing kids only in New York City. Yeah. And you be walking around and see Steve Harris or see Kiss. I was going home from school. I was on a bus. You talk about going to see Kiss on 57th Street because they had an office there and you guys figured it out. I'm on a city bus going home and I see Paul Stanley out the window of the bus browsing for watches. He's looking in the windows of like Rolex watch stores. Nobody could care less. He was very famous at this point. Yeah, man. And I, I pulled the handle. I get off the bus. I had a camera. <laughs> I love it. Camera, and really? I got a picture of me and Paul Stanley, you know, in front of uh, the watch store. You actually did it. That, I love that. That's what I would do. I, you, would, you and I would hang out because that would happen. Because you know how many times – Remember the old the buses? They, I think they're still Manhattan Express. Remember in, in the Bronx? So they, that's how we got downtown to Manhattan from the Bronx. It was called Manhattan Express. I think it was like two fifty, three fifty, and you get on the bus. It's done. I, you know how many times I saw Paul walking up Madison Avenue, and there was one time I did that. I did that. I I got off. The, I wasn't. I don't even know what the hell I was. I think it was in Harlem or something. I got up. I, I and I stopped. And the next stop was Harlem because I had to wait like twenty more blocks to get off and run back to see Paul. But that's the kind of fan, right? That's what you do. I love that part of life. It was so rich. It was so great. Well, yeah, and and it's so genuine. And what an yeah. amazing experience to meet your heroes, and then uh, and not not to be disappointed, and to motivate you even more. And then later, as the book takes you on that journey, you're an anthrax. There's people who idolize you. And one of the things I want to mention, I don't want to forget this, is the line of bases that you put out. And so. I want to make sure we, we, we talk about this because you put out uh, a line through Fender. This is, yeah. this is a, a Squire bass, and this is an affordable bass. These Absolutely. basses were about 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is such a great thing to do. It, it, some people, there's always these snobs when it comes to music. If you can't play the $300 bass, then you can't play anyway. You know, and these people... There's no wrong way to make music. And I think for young people, they can't afford this these these thousand dollar bass. You're not gonna sound like Steve Harris buying a thousand dollar bass anyway. <laughs> it, you put out a product that I think people and the, the other thing is that pe the reviews of this thing were great. Even yeah. the people who might be music snobs um, said that this is a really quality thing. Are these things are they still available now? They are still available. You know, I have a couple of them, one's for my son, who I'm still trying to get to play. Mm -hmm. um yes and i believe they still are available and i see them around and let me tell you something i was with fender for a long time then i went to esp and now i'm in limbo we'll see what happens coming soon um those bases there's a specific reason for that i was that kid that couldn't afford those bases it made a lot of sense to me i don't it didn't matter at that age whatever age it's like if you're younger and say i want to play bass I don't, I don't want to say, oh, I can't afford that. My mom can't help me with that and all that. Yeah, I don't want that. For me, it's about getting the bass in the hands of, of people. And whether the company wants to do it, I mean, I work with Chris Gill back back then at Fender. He was great. He was a great, great dude. And he understood. And the Fender people were awesome people to, to work with. Um, it, all, it all made sense. So I would like to do that wherever I go next, wherever I'm, I'm talking to some people now. I want to make sure, and I, I still try to make sure people can afford my bases. I get it. I understand. It's it. You want all the bells and whistles, but at the same time, I want you. I want. I just want you to play. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I because I want to pass the torch. I want to see people have that kind of outlet that you and I have. You know, we we have that outlet. I think it's important 
that you could pick up an instrument and get it get out of a bad day. Uh, I keep and, a squire bass. I keep a squire bass close to me at all times, and uh, and you know the, the bass is meant to be beat up a little bit. It's not really meant to be hung on the wall, you know. Yeah, and yeah. so you can go through these things that are affordable, and people see it and go, well, "What are you playing? That looks like the bass that Dee Dee Ramone played." It is, you know. Awesome. It, and because it's it's a bass, look, I get it. There's more. There's different woods and all that stuff. The bells and whistles, the pickups, the knobs. I get it. The wood. Start off somewhere. Look, I was that kid in the music store looking outside. Oh man, I can't afford that. Five hundred five hundred dollars was insane. There's no way. Couldn't do that. So it made sense. So I hope to keep doing that along the way, and hope the companies want to come with me in that journey. You know. Yeah, I think that's a great part, and I think for the companies, it brings something as well because. You want younger, you know, the future is for younger people. You want people playing these basses and talking about them and, and, uh, and again, being able to afford them to make music. So especially yeah. now, dude, especially now in this environment where we're at, I want people to, I want to, I want to go to, I want to pick up, you know, I just want to pick up a bass and go and, and, ah, oh, man, I, I'm so angry. All right, get it, take it all on that. Take it all. You know, that's what I used to do, man. I had a bad day. I would pick up my bass and all of a sudden 10 minutes in, I'm good to go. It really, right. it, that, that's how it works for me. And during this pandemic, basses and guitars are being sold like crazy. People are picking it up. Um, you know, it's it's. Could you awesome. imagine that when you were a kid that there was a thing called YouTube and you could just learn how to play? Yeah, it's crazy. Dude, instead of just keep a repetition, you know, there's a great thing about. And I say that in my bass clinics, actually, I say you have this great thing called YouTube. I mean, if you you don't have to keep listening over and over, you can just watch over and over exactly what's. I go to dude. There was some Rush songs. I just kept going to YouTube and Getty, and because there was some things that it bothered me in the hell, I couldn't get it. You ever not get it? It's like one little note that's being a pain in the ass, and mm -hmm. me, the nitpicker, I have to pick out that one note. So I'm literally on YouTube, I'm stopping it, and I'm trying to get, stop it exactly on the spot, and I'm driving myself crazy. Come on! You know, I'm like, what the fuck? It was so frustrating, but when you get it, it's like, ah, oh, yes. Well, you know? yeah, it's... You know, I, I play here in Vegas. I've played a million cover songs. Sometimes we, we let's learn this song in the next few hours. Yeah. I go on YouTube. Some 16-year-old kid in Thailand is going to teach me how to play. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It's a great when You got to do it quick. Yeah. You just go right to that video, man. I, I, I'll just I'll follow this kid or whatever. I don't care how old you are. You you know this song. You know the song. It's all good. Yeah. And, and so, like, like again, the, during this time, it's great to see how many people are making music, learning how to write a song, doing these yeah. things. And uh, but so I got to ask you, I've made, you know, I've kind of made a rule on the channel. Never talk about the pandemic and never talk about politics because yeah. people's politics are so divided. We've never been more yeah. divided as a country. Why do we need to know who our hero votes for? Because all it's going to do is disappoint somebody. So yeah. I've avoided it. But in your case, I've well, got to at least ask. Sure. Do you ever think to yourself? Why does COVID have to be so big and not Anthrax? Have you thought about changing the name of the band? Because you guys were so huge during the Anthrax craze to the point where you you people wanted you to change your name. For all the wrong reasons. I remember that, that ticker on the, on the CNN ticker on the bottom of the screen said, um, I guess Scott did an interview. He says, we're going to change our, he was kidding around, of course, in jest. We're going to change our names to Basket Full of Puppies. That became this enormous thing. Anthrax changing their name to Basket Full of Puppies. Like that would have happened. But that's that's press and that's media, and we all know what that's about nowadays. So, you know what? All I've ever wanted to do is just be a musician and make people feel good, you know. And I want to be the distraction from the rest of that world politics, COVID. I want to be the distraction that gets you away from that. That's what means everything to me. I want to, I want you to put on a record or, or maybe pick up a bass. Inspire if I can inspire that, you know, if this book inspires you to do something proactive and, and creatively, dude, come on. That's what it's about, because I think people get everything out of the way. Your politics, I don't give a shit, whatever it is. Just we have one life. And that's what, look, that's the way I look at it. Uh, I have some people, some good friends of mine who passed from COVID. Um, it's time to just get the politics out of the way and just everybody really get, get back together again. Yeah, it's and do really what's important. best for them. Don't let yeah. someone decide what's best for you. Do no, and best. just think for yourself. Think for yourself. You have one life. Use it, man. That is an underlying theme in your book, which is that life is short. It, it, it could not be shorter now than it's ever been before. Nope. Uh, what I like also about your book is, you know, when I got to, I got to tour with some bands that I worked with and I got to play on my own. I remember 
saying, I was always doing the business. Somehow I always end up at the management end of it as well. <laughs> when we played the whiskey, I said, I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to look around and I'm going to enjoy this moment. And I've told yeah. everyone, if you ever get the opportunity to be in a band, you don't know how long it's going to last. So go out and see whatever there is in that town. Go take it in and don't, uh, don't wake up and go, oh man, I missed out. Reading your book, I really feel like you did take it in. You know, I did. I did, and here's why, because we've been fortunate. We've been touring, so, look, I got in the band at 17 years old. So my life is, I went into the, I call it the College of Anthrax. It just st started there and I kept going. I remember in the, and you know, you go to stuff like that, you come in, on, you maybe you go to a bar, you stay in that bar the whole night and you don't really get to see the, 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 the beauty of what's going on around you. Now, it's a completely different story. Wherever I go, I go specifically look out for specific things that I want. I plan it out. I think it's important. Oh, look, I'm, unless I'm tired and all that stuff and you're sick and you're tired, yeah. you want to go in the room. But man, this is so much because it, it goes like that. And it's like, man, I should have. My thing is now, dude, Jason, I don't want to ever say I should have. Mm -hmm. that's, my, that's my point, man. That's what I want to push forward to people. It's, it's again, I don't want to preach the help the preaching shit. Look, if I know something that can help you, I'm going to say it. Why not? What, what do we got to lose? Try it. Try, you know, live life to the fullest. And I know it's, a, it's the obligatory line, but man, when you have a little taste of that, when I, what I've seen, what I've seen in my life, it goes this, it's like this short life and it goes like that. So, um, yeah. And uh, that's absolutely, people got to live in the moment. And, it's amazing that anthrax is 40 years old. It's, it's, it doesn't seem imaginable. Even when you say that, even when you, it's insane, you know, it's insane. I don't get it. And it's I, great that it's still going. And, uh, it, it, you know, it just, it, that it's still, that it's still such a thing. I saw a video of you guys from Rock, Oklahoma playing caught in a mosh. It's, it's, it's as insane as it was when I was a kid, you know, uh, thankfully. Yeah. It's uh, look, I still get turned on play, you know, the energy from the crowd, look, we're lucky enough to do this for a living. I mean, right off the bat, thank you. I mean, I'm very thankful for that. But then to be able to do it this time, 40 years in, have a crazy crowd out there, all that stuff, the people showing up, waiting to see you. I'm going to, you know, it, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you play that song. It's still fresh that night for them yes. and me because I'm getting that reaction. You know, you play, you get that reaction that night. That's, it's all new. It, the song, yeah, it could be an older song. It doesn't matter that that energy together is all new and that's what you're going for and there's someone, for. there's someone singing it for the first time when i do these interviews i tell people i know you've told this story a lot but there's always somebody who's learning about somebody for the first time and it's uh you know it's like being on broadway every night's a new show and uh and i think that that's important that you that you said that about anthrax that you you know you don't let it get stale and you guys do a really good job i don't know who the mastermind behind it is but you guys from the 24 part series on youtube to the shows where you play full albums to the let the fans pick the set list you, you guys are involved anthrax has become very um interactive yeah i think we're all fans you know we grew, we grew up as fans and we, we wanted to carry that over i always say i'm a fan who plays in a band that's the truth I never want to lose that. I mean, you can't get above and beyond all that bullshit. Oh, I, I don't do that. Fuck that. I want to dig in. I want to dig in and know the, what the pulse is. You, you have to do that. That's what we love. That fire in your gut, dude. It never goes away. Why? Why would I block that out? I want to live this. I'm lucky enough to do this. I want to live it with the... I'm a fan that's playing on stage. That's all I am. That's the way I feel. I want to rage. I want to get you in a good mood. I want to have a good time. So the money you paid to see that, that show is worthwhile. And that's the God's honest truth. You know, people might get mad at me for saying this, but I, I feel like it's a New York thing. The, uh, my favorite band, I bought a guitar because of Johnny Ramone. I was fortunate to, you know, do things with those guys over the years. And awesome. New York is a different attitude. You can be a fan. I felt like sometimes the other coast might've been a little too cool for school. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, I'm generalizing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But there was definitely this attitude where, you know, in New York city, you could see Joey Ramone walking up the street or you could see anthrax walking up the street. It was a normal thing and everyone was approachable. Yeah, I want to talk about anthrax just a little bit before we get sure. back to the book. Uh, anthrax has got some hooch out. We got to make sure <laughs> we talk about the new anthrax whiskey. Dude. Obviously you guys were kiss fans. You got whiskey now. Dude, have you tried that? I have not yet. 
Uh, and look, I'm not, I'm not pushing it. Look, I, well, I'm supposed to push it, but I'm just telling you that the truth is, it's awesome. It's, it's the real deal. S Scott and I went up to Hill Rock and, and did a taste test, and we, uh, we picked the right, the real deal, and they do an amazing job. It's, I'm so proud of it because, you can, you could just have a good, good old time. It doesn't make you feel bad. It's very smooth. And look, and I told this. I think I wrote a quote for them, and this is the guys on the truth. They had a bunch of a bunch of booze all around us for tasters. And this, as soon as I had this, this was the one that stuck out. And I said, I want another glass. As soon as I had that, because that was it. And I was tasting a bunch of them. This absolutely stood out. No hangover, no, because I was I was feeling good. But um, it, it was, it's absolutely everything that I want. And it, it represents us well. Well, I saw you describe it also. You said, you know, you get a nice little warm feeling. I think yeah. that kind of booze is, this isn't meant to be chugged. No. It's nice to get a nice warm feeling and a, and, a, and a little buzz from it. So this is available uh, right now. Yes, so you can order it. I yeah. make sure. And you have, it's, you know, it's got cool packaging and a chance to win this uh, golden ticket. So I Go to anthrax.com. It has all the information, all the, all the how to get it and this, this contest we're doing. It's a, for, for me, and I wouldn't say this because I'm not going to push something that's not real. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you want to you want to look, you have a bad day at work. Sit down and not, look. This isn't a commercial. I'm just saying this is what I do. <laughs> this is what I do. Sit on my porch. You have a shit day. Sit out. <sighs> just take a swig, right? Look, no gulp in anything, man. I'm telling you, smooth, smooth. And and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of we put we put quality products out with great companies, and that's important because you got to care. Yeah, absolutely. And there's tons of cool stuff there. There's graphic novels that yeah. you, got, you, you go to anthrax.com and you'll see all that yeah. and see upcoming dates, dates for 2022 as well. While we're talking about anthrax, I got to ask a question that you probably get sick of answering. Dan Spitz. Love him. Is Dan awesome. Spitz ever going to play with anthrax again? I don't know. I can't answer that question. Here's why. Because I don't know the future. I'm lucky I'm here today. <laughs> That's how I live. Like we've talked about this. I don't know about tomorrow. I love Danny's a great dude. He's a smart, he's a great guitar player, but who knows about tomorrow? I don't know about anything. Has anybody I, asked him? No, I don't think so. I mean, we're, we're quite, we're quite happy what we're doing now with John Donay. You know, we have John Donay in the band, but um, Danny's a great, did you see the video with Dan? I think he, he did great. He does appear he, in yeah. the, the Anthrax series. I, it, was, it, was awesome. I think it was nice for fans to, to see him, you know, the, the, the old school guitar player Danny's, from the band. He, He's a great dude. I love him. He's part of the family, of course. Great guitar player. You know, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a master watchmaker, which is incredible to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a great thing that he, you know, he found, he found his passion. That's great. Again, what we, it was fun watching all those videos. We had Neil Turbin. I thought that was great. Danny Loker. It was fun to go back to those videos and see, because for me, I didn't see their interviews until I saw it, as you did. Right. So, so it's fresh. It was, it was so fresh, <clears throat> and it was great to see them again. You know, it felt like I'm, I'm really happy to see them. I, mean, I think they did great. I thought it was awesome. You, you guys skipped Greg D'Angelo, though. You started just a little after. Well, that was before me. Right. No, I know. <laughs> I, have, I have nothing to do with it. You know, so. But oh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a fun thing, man. I, I really enjoyed it. And again, everybody's like from our past is a part of the family forever. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And again, anything you want to know about Anthrax is in that uh, is in that series. And, yeah. and, and it's pretty amazing. And as you said, it, the things continue to happen. It's still being written. Um, when you read this book, like we said earlier, you get a picture of someone really talking, and it's an easy read. If you're like me, you really don't like to read books. Yeah, you know. Uh, I get you, it. What about an audio? Are you going to do an audio book? Funny enough, you say that. I just, <laughs> you know, there's so many things. When you, I've never done a book. I'm, I'm being really honest with this. I'm learning as I go. Then I found out about the audio book. It's better if the person does it. So I signed the contract. I did it. And now I'm booking in Manhattan. So I'm, long story short, yes, I will be doing five days straight of audio book. Uh, I nice. think two weeks from now, which will be fun because I'm going to, for me, this is my life. I'm going to talk to you like you and I are talking right now. I'm not going to put the pronunciation like this. I'm, I'm not doing no. any of that shit. I want to talk to you like you and I are talking. I want the emotion. It's going to be hard, as you know to get through some of these parts and we're going to have to take, you know, some, some of the breaks, like the stuff about my brother, I, I can't talk without crying about that stuff. So even then when I mentioned that I just started floating me off, but um, I'm looking forward to it. Cause I just want to, I want the energy there. I, you know, I think the energy is because um, it's my life and I, I want people to feel it. 
Well, and the book, I'm reading it, I hear it in your voice, but I hear, I speak New York, you know, if, if I read it, people would criticize the way I say water or coffee or, yeah. you know. Uh, and you, you got rid of your accent a little bit. I can hear that. You you have your R's, like you, you pronunciate your R's a little bit better than, definitely better than me, but because um, I fly, I'm like Scorsese, I, I, I well, just the only way I'm like Scorsese, I fly with my words sometimes and I have to slow myself down. Right. And when you're reading it, you know, it, it takes a minute. I, I, you know, it's certain words that I still, I still have, but I think that because the book, you do feel like someone's talking to you that I yeah. think people really will enjoy this audio book of you telling these stories. And for people who aren't New Yorkers or didn't grow up around that time, as I'm, as I'm re reading the book, I'm thinking back at, uh, the old Tom Carvel commercials. <laughs> you, you, you remember Tom Carvel? Of course, I love that. I'm Tom Carvel. I used to love those commercials. The guy sounded like he had the worst emphysema. I felt know? so bad for him, but he, you know what? He stayed around for a good long time, didn't he? He did those commercials for years, dude. He did. He got poisoned, by the way. If you wonder whatever happened to That's, Tom Carvel, you see, I didn't know that. How? What? It's like there's a, we got to we'll have to Wikipedia, but it's a someone was trying to get his money, and it was a, a crooked employee. The Tom, we oh should option God. the Tom Carvel movie. I had no idea that happened. I'm sorry, my God. I was wondering what happened. I thought he just passed because he's an older man. He was. He seemed like a hundred when he was pushing Fudgy the Whale on us, right? <laughs> Don't forget Fudgy the Whale, dude. But you laugh. I loved the Fudgy the Whale when I was growing up. I, oh, I thought great. it was great. All Carvel cakes grew the crunchy in the middle. That's the that's the that's the flavor right there. And I the Carvel it. cakes were like the same pan. They would just turn it upside down and then oh yeah, paint it differently. I it. But everything. So I, I love it. I was thinking about that. I'm thinking about watching The Honeymooners and The Odd Couple on Channel 11. Dude, they don't play The Odd Couple. They only play The Odd Couple here. And The Honeymooners, they have them on the weekends, The Honeymooners. But The Odd Couple, for some reason, which I love, I own them all. Mm -hmm. But they only play them on New Year's Eve. Right, New it's Year, a marathon. They, they have, they, yeah, it's a marathon, which is wonderful. And I stay up all night and watch them I'm, and take them. You have I'm to. Not. It's on, I, It's on Hulu also. And uh, they would have the guy who'd come on in between the shows, Richard Hughes. You remember him? He wanted to know your opinion. That's so good. They have it on, by the way, you said Hulu, they have them on? Odd Couple's on Hulu, yeah. I did not, I'm getting Hulu. I didn't even have Hulu. I'm going to get Hulu. Shit. And it's on the, whatever the, we, we give a commercial for the Odd Couple because it's one of the greatest shows ever. But oh, oh, yeah. there's a few episodes missing, but they, they it's it's great. And, you know, on their basic plan, you can watch as many as you want. But I'll uh, take it. I also, and I'm an old, you know, I'm an old school fan. So the Mary Tyler Moore show is my favorite show of all time because of, Ted Baxter, you know, uh, Ted Knight, the, the mm -hmm. comedic guy. Because of him specifically, um, it, for me, there's nobody better than that ever. So he's underrated, but it's one of those oh, underrated yeah. actors. Yeah, uh, in, in, incredibly funny guy. And nobody's so gonna, nobody's going to know what we're talking about, but that's that's fine. It's just between you. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I feel like, though, you know, so many times I talk about these, uh, you know, major things that people already know. I feel like if you're a New Yorker right now, you're watching this and you know exactly what we're talking about. Oh yeah. You read this yeah. book, you're gonna go, holy shit, you know, I recognize this and that and uh, True. the different things that happened. And again, you could be a non-New Yorker and kind of get the get the vibe. Anthrax is about as New York a band as it comes. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's funny thing is, Jason, most of the people I'm getting emails from and all, all these great things uh, that have read the parts of the book are not from New York. They're mm -hmm. just they're living it. They're kind of living it and they're feeling part of it, which I love, which is exactly what I want them to do. I want them to make them feel part of it. And people from not all around the all around the world right now, they're, they're, they're getting little segments of this of this book and they're starting to feel part of it. So I can't wait till they read the books because it's exactly what I wanted to do. I want to make it like you and I were sitting at a bar and we're talking about stories. That's that's it. And I think people are getting that, which is awesome. Yeah. And uh, you know, again, I want to make sure that people realize the book comes out October 12th. Yes. A lot of people are going to be watching this in replay, so it's probably already available. The link is in the description, so it's easy to get. It's yes. called Fathers, Brothers, and Sons, Survival, Anguish, Abandonment, and Anthrax. And so you got to check it out. I, I wouldn't give you my endorsement if I didn't think it. I'm still hooked. You know, I'm still... Thank you, Jason. It's from my heart. Thank you, bro. Yeah, I, got, I got a physical copy. I got a digital copy. I got the... <laughs> I got the... Uh, I just got to get the the... The whiskey now, and uh, little, little read, little drink, little read, little drink. Nothing wrong with that. What uh, you know, you're going to be promoting this book for a while. Obviously, yeah. that's how this thing works. And nowadays, you know, you do sit in your basement. And uh, by the way, I, I love all the monster stuff. I got my monster characters behind me yeah. as well. Yeah, Universal's uh, where I'm at. That 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 era was so special to me. I, I love that. 
I love all horror, as my son and my wife do. They horror fans, but uh, this specifically, that you know, that was for me. That was awesome. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Universal horror changed my life. I saw Abner Costello meet Frankenstein. I was like, these are the coolest characters ever. Is that is that it? Yeah. Love yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, that's that's life for me, man. Yeah, absolutely. So okay, so I want to make sure that people check out the book. What what's next, Frank? I know you got a million things, but what's, what's you know that? what? I'm happy to, to to be creative in this time. So look, obviously we're writing an Anthrax record, which I'm not supposed to talk about now. My my publicist said please don't talk, but we're writing an Anthrax record. We're very very psyched. So long story short, other side, I'm writing solo songs. I have I just recorded a few solo songs. We don't know we're going because you know Dave Ellison and I did this altitudes and attitude thing right. a few years back. And a lot of people like that, uh, which is very cool. Uh, so I've written, wrote a lot of the songs on those on that record. So this is like the continuation of that. Just but actually, it's just me doing it. So I've written them. I don't know what Megaforce wants to do with them yet. We're gonna see. But I'm psyched about that. The book's gonna be a lot of stuff. I, I would love to do some appearances with this stuff. I don't know what the climate is here with COVID. Right? Was what we planned on doing? What I wanted to do was do like open mics and, and do some songs with an acoustic, you know, have a Q and a at places, bookstores and stuff like that, little clubs. And I just don't know if that's going to be available to me. I would love to do that, but that's what we're talking about. We just don't know what the COVID climate is right now. Hopefully you, know? you guys can do some of these uh, virtual signings. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Okay. And that's, you can uh, sign books while watching the books uh, uh, published by rare birds books, which is a great company. And it is. It's, it's awesome. And they it's put really, out, yeah you, can get it, you, yeah, you can get it at Rare Bird. Yeah, you can, that's another, that's where you can get it from this. I did a bunch of signed copies, rarebirdlit.com. You can okay, get it. Nice. They have them at rarebirdlit.com. Yeah, so we'll put a link to that too. And, you know, as you say, you're not supposed to talk about anthrax music, but everybody knows anthrax is going to continue. That you know, uh, Yeah, dude. Hey, we're hungry. Hey, I can say this about anthrax. The guys in the band are hungrier now than ever. So I can honestly say nobody's tired. Nobody is wants to give anything up. Everybody's biting at the bit. And I believe this is all going to lead to a lot of great songs. I hope for other bands, too. I think other bands are going to write great songs in this time. You know, I think there's a lot of anxiety and a, a lot of anguish, a lot of fire in your belly. This is, it's, it's, the great, uh, it's a great way of, of getting it out of you. So um, I, I'm looking forward to uh, – I know what we have already is pretty – Pretty fierce. I'm very psyched about, but uh, I'm looking forward to what we have coming. So there's a lot of guys stuck at home with their wives. Not saying you. But there's <laughs> a lot of guys ready to get back on the road. You know? <laughs> Dude, I look. I would love. Look, I'm in my basement. This is where I've. You're looking where I've been during the whole time of COVID here. I mean, my wife's upstairs working. My son, you know, he's upstairs doing his schoolwork from a computer virtually. We we had him home. He's 15 years old, going going nuts like everybody else, right? We're all going nuts with this stuff. Um, so I'm hoping. Eventually, you and I could sit down and have a beer at a bar, you know, yeah. and, and, and get through this old coffee. I don't care what it is. Just get out and just be human again, right? Is there anything that you didn't put in the book that you just said, I can't tell the story? No. No. And Let you know it. what? And I, I, I could say that it's fast like that, honestly, because I'll tell you this, Jason, after I gave the final okay on the book and I did my thousand time of reading it, I was scared shit. I was scared shit because that is this is my life, and I, I know I went probably deeper than a lot a lot of people. I, it's raw. I felt very raw, to be really honest with you, and I didn't know how people were going to take the brother thing, all that stuff, some of the stuff, the poverty thing. I, a lot of people didn't know that stuff, but I kind of got. I was like, oh my god, is this going to be cool with people to to deal? But I guess as long as I'm honest, dude, and this is all honest. Um, I feel good about it because it's honest, and that's Have it. The and guys in Anthrax read the book. Yes, yes, I, get, I got the okay, you know, from everybody. Everybody's happy, you know. I mean, look again, it's me, you know. It's they know me, they know my story, so uh, they've been there. The whole thing about growing up in a band, they were there for my brother's death. They were there for everything in the in the beginning. So I grew up with these guys from seventeen years old. So I know them more than you know. I've been with them more than my family. Think about it. It's right. great hearing the stories where you're on the road and you fly home and you and Charlie are still living at your grandmother's house and you guys, you know, you spend all the time on tour, you're on the plane and then just go to your room, you know, you see each other at, at dinner. So it's exactly that. It's exactly what, and, and, it, and I look at them now and back then it was like, oh my God, we're, you know, we're going to be in the same place. Now you look back at it. Those are the best times of my life. It really yeah. was. 
And it's great that you're able to share them, you know. And as we get older, we don't remember every detail. And like you said, sometimes you need somebody to say something. You go, oh, my God, if you didn't tell me that, I wouldn't have remembered being being there because you've yeah. been active. Joe MacGyver, my co-writer again, uh, he knows more about me than I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. But he knows how to f light the fire under a story. And he's just got that knack to get me really going. And once we started, man, it was, I, it was fun, almost like I could see – I could have the vision right in front of me of what happened. And we were laughing all over again. It was just so much fun and some of the pain and all that stuff. But, uh, it was, uh, it was a trip, man. The, the whole experience was a trip. It was. And, uh, I hope people, I look for me, if one person says to me that, that this book, uh, made them feel good and, 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 and put another, a, a kick in their step somehow, that's really important to me. It's my story. I stick by it and I'm proud of it. Yeah. And I think that, uh, if you're looking for inspiration, if you're grieving, there's a lot of things that this book does. It's not a downer by any means. Yes, no, these no. are hard life lessons, but uh, for every tragedy, there's a triumph in the book. And I think that uh, that's something people enjoy. I got to ask you a question about the book though. Yeah. Uh, you tell a story, you're taking a piss and bouncer comes in, he puts his arm, a bodyguard, puts your arm and shoulder. He tells Too you, strong. you got to get out because uh, an another famous rock star you say of extremely famous. He's got very to, famous. Very he's famous, got to yes. use the bathroom. Is there any chance you're going to tell me who that rock star is? No, no, I can't do it. I promised I wouldn't say it, and I don't want to get sued either. So, <laughs> so, uh, so let's dive into that then. Who did you promise that you wouldn't say it to? Everybody, everybody, band management, all that stuff. The truth, the truth being, it's not worth it because I'm not a fan of that very famous rock star, mm -hmm. right? Um, if, even if I was before that, I wouldn't have been because I was just going to work. I was literally going on the same stage that that person was going to go on right at, well, two, two bands after or whatever, whatever, how many bands it was. It didn't matter. I, I don't understand how, if you're in midstream taking a piss, I'm a human being, how, if you have to take a shit, why do you have, why can't you wait? Why can't you pinch your cheeks a little bit and wait that extra couple of minutes until I drain my dick out and, and, and I'm finished. I can go on the stage. That's, that's my whole point was it's, it's very honest. It's very real. And that really happened. I was very intimidated because anybody knows if they're in mid, midstream of taking a piss and you get a big hand like this, Patty, you, you're disrupted. That stops the flow right there. Right? So yeah, I still remember to this day. And then, then you get stage fights. Oh man, I can't keep going now because this guy's watching me. He wants me to get out and you can't go, go you know? So I had and to go finish on what time. I could. Yeah, and I, I had to finish whatever else I can get out and go on stage. I just think that was unnecessary. So that's a, just a story. It was a real story that I don't understand the, the power of fame and how it makes you think you're better than anybody. It was just one of those stories that really pissed me off. That taught me another lesson. Never, I would never treat people like that anyway. But right. it happened. And that was the point of the story. Now, for those of you watching who want to know, you got to go to Google. You got to put in Anthrax. I believe Dio is the next band. You find out the tour. Oh, no. no? No, no, no. No, I know it was, it was a deal because you say good yeah. things. I love Ronnie James Dio. He's the okay, best. So I, I don't Ronnie James Dio. Quick, quick story I'll tell you, Jason. And I say this in the book. One of my favorite times with, um, ever in my life was my birthday in Greece with Ronnie James Dio. His birthday was July 10th. Mine is, mine is July 9th. And I love this man so, so much because he's a Yankee fan. I still talk to him like I talk like he's still here because Ronnie will, is always here with me and with us. Um, and I remember on top, we were on top of the, uh, it was a great bar on top of the, of the hotel we're staying at. It was a great terrace with the, uh, with the Acropolis right there. We could see it all. It was awesome, right? So we were talking Yankees, right? Talking Yankees, as your shirt says. We were talking Yankees. And we're just going back and forth, just talking about trades and stuff like that. And he, it was his birthday. He was just about to turn his birthday. It's my birthday. He goes, Frank, let me buy you a beer for your birthday. Ronnie James Dio, as a fan, dude, little, little Frank Bellow, Ronnie James Dio is saying, let's buy you a beer. And we cheered to our birthday, dude, on his birthday and mine. One of the highlights of my life was that night. So yeah, it's, there's uh, nothing but amazing things. That was a beautiful person. His, his voice will never be touched. All good things, you know. But so, as far as that other story, that was for somebody, that was another band that, you know. Yeah, was, oh, I don't want to make it worth out. Like yeah, I don't want no, anyone no. to think it's Ronnie James Dio because you- No, you, Ronnie was the best. He does Absolutely. say in the book, he's using the example that Dio would not have done this type yeah. of thing. I've had so many musicians on who played with him. You never hear a bad thing about the guy. Ronnie was the best. In, inside and out, just the 
the perfect the, the perfect representative of metal period that's it and person just a good person good heart man he talked to you like you were his friend you know what i mean a guy with that 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 amazing voice and that amazing talent so for me it, it, it was still i mean i still listen to to ronnie whatever he's done in his career whatever songs he sang on and written it still makes me feel good it makes me feel close to him it does yeah i can imagine yeah it's uh and that's how most people anyone who's had some connection to him that is how they uh, they feel. Anyway, there's tons of those inspirational stories in the book. Yeah. And again, he, he talks about Kiss, he talks about Iron Man, and then he goes and he tours with these kind of guys. So there's awesome. a, it's, it's really a fairy tale story. Again, fathers, brothers, and sons surviving anguish, abandonment, and anthrax. Available everywhere October 12th. Link in description to pre-order right now. Frank, thank you for spending some time. Jason, I have to compliment you, dude. This is I'm not kissing your ass here. That was great. You you got some of the parts of the book that I haven't heard in some of these interviews. So I want to thank you for that for bringing them out because they weren't um, they weren't brought out the way you brought them today. And I, I really thank you for that. I think people really got it. I got it from you. But thank you for really digging in and understanding what what this is about. I really appreciate it, bro. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, and thank you for sharing the book with me. You know, I went into it uh, not knowing what I'm going to get. Yeah. And really, it's it's page turning. So uh, thank you, man. I uh, thank you. That. I think people are really going to enjoy it. And hopefully, I'll, we'll have you back and we'll talk about some anthrax tours when that time comes. I'd love to, dude. In the meantime, be safe out there, okay? You too. Thanks, Frank. All right, Jason. Thank be you. well, bro. Bye bye.